and we're continuing this morning with our series on the Ten Commandments, not your grandpa's Ten Commandments, and I think we had a good time last week. I want to continue that this week, and then at the end of the service, let me just say that we will, you know, after the uh, Facebook part ends, we're going to have some more ministry time. We're going to try to incorporate that into every Sunday service. The musicians will come back. I'll stay here and minister, and um, we're going to see how the Lord moves in that way this morning. But let's go to the Lord in prayer today. And Lord, we thank you for bringing us here together. I ask you that as we study these Ten Commandments, that you would anoint me, that the words I speak would not be mine but yours that they would be spirit and truth and would not return void, but would accomplish what you sent them to do. Lord, give, them, give us listening ears and open hearts to receive your word, and I praise you and thank you for it in Jesus' name. To those of you watching on Facebook, let me just say that next Sunday is Pack a Pew. And if you haven't been here in a while or if you've never been here, Come in and help us pack a pew. We're going to get everybody together. We've got a coffee truck coming. We're going to give a prize to the person that brings in the most people, and you'll want to be part of that. Amen. Well, let's go to, let's go to the Word this morning. Last week I did the introduction to the Ten Commandments and explained them in a way that I hope most of you haven't heard before. I've been at this a long time, and I'd never heard it like this until I started studying for this series. Well, actually, before that, I started studying for the series as a result of having seen the Ten Commandments in a new light. I gave you the introduction, explained how we're going at it, and today we're going to start with the commandments themselves and Sunday by Sunday, until we get done, we're going to go through each of the commandments and talk about what that commandment really means. The first commandment is, I believe, the key to understanding the Ten Commandments. Everything else that flows from uh, the first, everything else flows from the first commandment into the other Ten Commandments. And I'll say more about that in just a minute. So we're going to start with commandment chapter 1. We are in Deuteronomy chapter 5, if you're following along with your Bible. And the first commandment says this, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. This is the commandment, as I said, that sets the tone for all the other commandments because for so many years, decades, <clears throat> centuries, people have read the Ten Commandments as if they are this legalistic bunch of rules that God wants to beat us over the head with and if you mess them up, you're going to go to hell or something bad's going to happen and all that. And that's really, <clears throat> I realized as I began looking at the Ten Commandments again, I realized that is not what the Ten Commandments are about. Okay? The Ten Commandments are actually about God's love for us, our love for Him, and our love for each other. That's what the Ten Commandments are about. And if I had to pick one word to describe them, they are about freedom. I always thought that God was bound and determined to make sure that back in my younger and squirrelier days, I hope they were squirrelier days, I always thought that God's commandments, God's rules were all about making sure that nobody possibly could have any fun whatsoever. That if anything was fun, it must be sinful, and God wanted us to go around looking like, you know, we were nursed on a pickle and weaned on a persimmon, or however the saying goes, and, you know, that he wanted to strip all the fun out of our lives and just have us going around 
going holy, holy, holy or something like that until we, <laughs> until we dropped dead from boredom. And in fact, nothing could be further from the truth. And these commandments, even though they introduce the law of the Old Testament, were not given to keep us in bondage. They were given to make us truly free. They're about freedom. One, one word here is freedom. That's what the commandments are about. And he starts out by saying in the first commandment, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods besides me. Now, in this time and in this place, this was a radical statement on multiple fronts. One, one front was the idea that there could just be one God because virtually every culture, with the possible exception of the Zoroastrians, but every other culture known to man had uncountable numbers of gods. They had gods for everything. Everything was a god. The sun was a god. You know, the moon was a god. They had male uh, deities and female deities, and they had idols, and they had the god who was god over the crops, and they had a bazillion gods. And God starts out by saying, this is not correct. In fact, children of Israel, I am the only true God. There's just one God. And I am, that's his name, I am is he. I am the Lord thy God. And so he says to them, there's just one God for you. All these other cultures may have a hundred gods, you're only allowed to have one God, and I will be that God. But here's what you need to know about that, children of Israel. What you need to remember is you were slaves down in Egypt for 430 years. You lived in what, the, what it literally says in the Hebrew, the slave barracks. You lived in the slave ghetto. You were held in bondage. Your life was not your own. You, you owed everything you had to your earthly masters who punished you and beat you and starved you and worked you to death. And that's where you come from. And that's where you would have stayed except for one thing. I, the Lord your God, had made a covenant with your forefathers, <clears throat> that you would be my people, and I, because of my covenant with your forefathers and my love for you, brought you out of 400 years of slavery by my mighty hand. I beat the heck out of Pharaoh, the, the most powerful man on earth, Talk about your authoritarian dictators. I mean, I mean, Pharaoh was one of the worst, and he was one of the, probably the most powerful man on earth. And God said, I made mincemeat out of Pharaoh. I subjected him to plagues. I slapped him around. I made him let you go. And then when he changed his mind, I parted the Red Sea and brought you across on dry land and swallowed up his army in the in the waters. I fed you manna out of heaven. I, I myself, by my mighty hand, because of my love for you and my power and my covenant with your fathers, I, the Lord your God, brought you out of slavery. Which one of these other 150 gods you had when you were down in Egypt how many of them ever brought you out of slavery? Answer, zero. They had no power at all. And he says, I have all power. I'm the one who set you free. And I want you to remain free forever. Can you say amen? 
I am all about freedom. I'm about life. I'm about deliverance. Therefore, don't worship any other gods but me. They can't do you any good, and I can. So you see the emphasis that he's making here is not on some legalistic rule. He's saying, and he says, all those passages we looked at last week that go right before the Ten Commandments and the passages right after, what he's saying to them here is, I have set you free and it is my desire that you never be enslaved again. I don't want you to be enslaved. I'm all about freedom. I'm all about deliverance. I'm all about liberty. So don't worship those trinkets the Egyptians had that never did you a lick of good. And so even here, he's not really talking about, in, in the larger sense to them, He's not saying, I am so needy and driven by my own God ego that I need you to worship me all the time and tell me how great I am. God doesn't need that. God knows how great he is. But what he's saying is, the minute that you, you quit worshiping me and start following other gods, what's going to happen is, they're not going to do you any good all over again and you'll fool around and mess up and end up back in slavery. I'm not going to put you back in slavery, but you will put yourselves back in slavery and I don't want you to be slaves. It's about them. You see, God is talking about his attributes, but he's not bragging on himself. He's trying to get their minds right because he is concerned about them. He wants them to be free. Can you say amen? And, and still today, all these thousands of years later, he still wants us to be freedom. They, the New Testament says it was for freedom that Christ sets you free. Christ was just following in the tradition of what God did when he brought the children of Israel out of slavery. He wanted them to be free. Jesus wants us to be free and not enslaved. And the first way we do that is by making sure we don't follow any of the world's gods. We only follow Jehovah, the one true God. Can you say amen? But listen to what all he says here to them. He says, you shall have no other gods. The word have there that's used in the Hebrew version of that word was a word that was generally used in the establishment of a marriage relationship or some other equally close family relationship. It was a relationship in which you became one heart, one mind, one flesh with somebody else. And he says, I don't want you. This is a, a, a vocabulary of love and commitment. And he's saying, I don't want you marrying some other gods. I want you to marry me. I want you to be one heart, one mind, one soul with me, and I will be all those things with you. And to the extent that you are joined together with me in this kind of relationship, you will find freedom. You will be free because I will make you free and I will protect your freedom. It's a covenant word. It's not a casual word. He's calling on them to be faithful to him as they would be to their spouse or their family. And in return, he promises the same faithfulness to them. Amen? So in other words, God is saying, I want to be your one and only. I want us to be family. I even want us to be married. I want us to be close. I'll love you and I expect you to love me. And if we do this, I'm going to keep up my end of the bargain. If you keep up your end of the bargain, what you're going to find is a relationship that you never imagined you could have, much less with Almighty God. 
And to whatever extent you're in this relationship with me, it will make you free indeed. I'm the one who, in, in the Hebrew says, took you or brought you up from the slave barracks in Egypt, which I just mentioned. But that word took you or brought you up, that doesn't just mean I allowed you to get out of slavery, which would be great in and of itself. But he says, I took you from slavery. I plucked you out of slavery. In other words, you were down there, you were helpless, you were captives, you were being treated horribly, and I myself, God Almighty, went down to Egypt, Egypt and snatched you out of the slave barracks. He, God showed up like the cavalry in one of those old western movies. You remember when the Indians are circling the, the wagons and everybody's about to be slaughtered or scalped or whatever is about terrible things about to happen to them? If you, if you love old movies like I do, you know this scene. And right when everybody's about to get wiped out, you hear... And the cavalry comes riding over the hill, you know, at a full gallop. And they ride down into the valley and they deliver the people. They snatch them out of certain death. That's kind of the image that he, of what he says here in the Hebrew. He's, he's not just saying, I open the gate and let you walk out. He says, I went down into Egypt like the cavalry, and snatched you out myself by my own hand. I took you out of the Pharaoh's hands to set you free. Can you say amen? amen? And so he's saying, I'm the one leading you from the smelly, drafty, wretched slave quarters to, and, and you're getting ready to go into the promised land. I have a land prepared for you, what the Bible calls the land of, uh, of milk and honey, the land flowing with milk and honey. And he's saying, I took you from the worst place you could possibly be and I'm getting ready to take you right now into heaven on earth. I'm the only one who loves you that much. I'm the only one who has the power to do that. And I was proactive in that I went down there and got you in order to do this. You might turn this around and say, God is, is asking them in a sense, why in the world would you have any other God but me? As a friend of mine used to say, why would you not want to follow Jesus? You know, when you know what Jesus does and who he is and what he's like, why would you not love him? Why would you not follow him? And that's the, what he's saying. He's saying, I'm the only one who possesses that kind of power. No other God could do that. I showed up and showed off, you know, and all the rest of it. I'm the lo one who loved you that much. No other God did. So don't put your faith in other so-called gods. Trust me and me alone for I truly have both the power and the desire to improve your lot, to heal you, and keep you free. He's saying to them, this is a plea really on God's part. He's saying to these people he loves, please let me take care of you. Don't run off from me. And he will say, well, I'll say more about this later because he says it more explicitly later. But he's, he's saying to them, in, in essence, now that we're joined together, don't divorce me. Don't leave me. I will never leave you. Stay with me and I will take care of you. And I will see to it that nobody conquers you, that you're never enslaved, that you're never held captive ever again. I love you, he's saying. Those other gods don't. They can't deliver you, and if you trust them, you'll falter and suffer and fail and end up alone and in slavery all over again, and I don't want that for you. Isn't that beautiful? You know? And remember we looked at last week, 
the passage that follows the Ten Commandments in Deuteronomy where after he's given them the commandments, he basically says almost as if God himself uh, is on the point of tears. He says to Moses, as much as I love them, they're not going to do this. I can see the future and they're going to end up in slavery again because they will not do this. And I wanted to take care of them and they're not going to let me. And sooner or later they're going to go back into slavery to the Assyrians and then they're going to go into slavery to the Babylonians. But then he says, but there will come a people in the last days who will let me be their God and whose commandments will not be written on tablets of stone, right? But will be written where? On the flesh of their heart. He says, I will write my commandments on their heart. And those will be people who don't follow me because they're afraid of me. They're not following me because they're afraid I'm going to punish them. They're going to follow me because I, they love me and they know I love them and they know who I am and they know I will take care of them and they depend on me to do it. Amen? And that's what God is doing in these days ever since he poured out the Holy Spirit on the church. The Holy Spirit gives us a new heart, a heart of flesh. And the Holy Spirit writes the commandments of God on our hearts. And we follow them not because we have to. We follow them because we want to. Amen? Because we know God was right. So the first commandment is God's love appealing to the Israelites and to us. <clears throat> the second commandment is very similar in some ways to the first commandment and repeats some of the same themes, but it's a little more explicit about some of the things God is talking about. Commandment number two says this, You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of what is in heaven above or on earth beneath or in the water under the earth. You shall not worship them nor serve them, for I am the Lord your God, and I am a jealous God, inflicting the punishment of the fathers on the children, even on the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing favor to thousands, to those who love me, see there's that love theme again, and keep my commandments. Now, last week we talked about this, and, and this is going to be, Repetitive, I talked about a lot of the first commandment last week, but I need to say this again. Maybe the most famous uh, rabbi in Jewish history was a guy named, and I, I'm going to butcher this, I'm afraid, Mammonides, I believe is how you pronounce his name. Most famous hero, in, uh, not hero, rabbi in Jewish tradition. And he says that we tend to ascribe to God our own attributes, all right? There's actually a $10 term for this that doesn't just apply to religious, term, to religious subjects. It's called anthropomorphizing. How do you like that? I'm not going to attempt to spell it for you, but it's called, it, you anthropomorphize. And that means when you take something that's not human and try to ascribe to it, the attributes of a human. And we do this all the time. You do that with your dog. Okay? I was over with the grandkid with the grandkids this week and one of their dogs, I think it was Lola, was trying to play with me or something and she had something in her mouth and I grabbed it and was trying to pull it out of her mouth. And one of the grandkids said, Look, she's smiling at you because she had her teeth bared. <clears throat> you know, and it looked like she was grinning. And that's anthropomorphizing. That is saying, okay, we smile at each other. And Lucy, I mean Lola, has got her teeth bared like someone who smiles. Really, she was just wrestling with me over the, the toy. But, you know, it looked like, I guess to the kid, that she was smiling. And so we attribute this human trait 
on an animal, a person, a thing, on some, or anything that's not human. And Maimonides, the rabbi, basically said that's what we tend to do with God, even in the scriptures, that God is so far beyond us in his emotions and in his power and in his feelings that we as humans can't really even comprehend. You know, the scripture in the New Testament says that God is able to do exceeding abundantly more than anything we could ask or think. And if you break that down, which we don't really have time to do very much, that's a really extraordinary statement because think of how big an imagination you have. You know, I can think, ask, and think some pretty big stuff. But the writer says, no, God is able to do abundantly more than you could even imagine, ask, or think. <clears throat> and then he says, well, really, he's able to do exceeding abundantly more, which means whatever abundantly more is, he exceeds the abundantly more. Does that make sense? And so it's like it's beyond, beyond, beyond. And so what Maimonides would say is God has emotions. God has power. God has feelings we can't as humans even perceive of how powerful he is, how good he is, you know, how intelligent he is. And what we end up doing most of the time, he said, is ascribing to God our own emotions and feelings and make, trying to make God like us. Does that make sense? And so I think you see this sometimes like in the Ten Commandments and in the law generally and in much of the, even in the, you know, within the Bible itself is if you think about these commandments, that's kind of what happens here. So God says to Moses, you know, in the second commandment, don't make yourself a graven image, don't worship idols, don't do all these things, because if you do, I will punish you all the way down to the third or fourth generations for abandoning, abandoning me. Well, we know in other places that's not exactly God's personality because God says, I never punish the son for the sins of the father, for example. You know, every tub sits on its own bottom and what you do is, what is, is on you and I don't punish you for somebody else's sins and all that. So that doesn't exactly hold water with God, but I think what Moses was seeing and what the children of Israel were seeing was something like this. God says, if you worship these idols, if you do these things I'm telling you not to do, you're going to see bad things happen to you and to your children and to your children's children. This is going to go on for generations. And so what they would have beheld is people disobeying God and sure enough, bad things happen to them. And so they interpret this as, they anthropomorphize, there's that word again, God by saying, well, clearly they disobeyed God, so God punished them. Am I making sense here? Yeah. Clearly God was getting even with them, and he even got even with their children and their grandchildren and their great-grandchildren because they messed up. I don't think that's the case at all. I think what's happening is God is, remember all of these commandments are built around that theme of, I am the God who brought you out of slavery. Don't follow any other gods or you'll end up going back into slavery. And so God is telling them, if you follow idols and you do all these things that I'm telling you not to, the repercussions are going to follow you and your children and your children's children for generations. You're going to end up back in slavery. You're going to end up being defeated. And I don't think he's saying, I'm going to smite you down and I'm going to do these things to you. 
He's saying here, these are the natural consequences of you following some other God other than me. And they interpret that as God punishing them. And God's not punishing them. He's saying the penalty is built into the offense. Does that make any sense? He's saying, he's saying none of these other gods have the power to do for you what I can do for you. But if you divorce me and you go after some trinket, some idol that you built for yourself and put up in your living room and you start worshiping him and you forget about me, you're going to move yourself outside of my ability to take care of you and it's going to be bad for you. Don't do this. You're bringing this penalty on yourself not that I am inflicting that on you. But they don't listen to God and they end up creating their own gods in their own image. And this second commandment is really important as is the first, as are they all. But this is really important because this goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden and original sin. What is the original sin of Adam and Eve? They didn't eat an apple. No, they didn't. There's not an apple even mentioned in Genesis. The fruit was the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. They ate of the tree of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. But what that was really about was, when you go back and read that, is that Adam and Eve had been given everything. God gave them the whole earth. God took care of them. He gave them his own powers to name everything on the earth, to subdue the plants and the animals and everything, to have dominion over the whole earth as long as they were walking in relationship with them. But their sin was this, or, or the, fruit, the motivation for their sin was this. The devil tempts them by saying, well, did God tell you not to eat of anything in the, in, in the garden? And they go, yeah. They, he said we could have everything on earth. We could have everything in the garden except that tree over there. We're not allowed to eat from that tree. And the devil goes, aha. You know why he told you not to eat from that tree, don't you? That's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And if you eat from that tree, your, your eyes will be opened. Your powers will be increased. And you will be as powerful as God, knowing good from evil. And so what drives them is not the taste of the fruit or anything else. What drives them is they're not willing to let God be God. They want to be God, right? And it turns out the devil actually in his own wicked ways, has spoken accurately to them. He's told them the truth. If they eat from that fruit, they're going to know good from evil. And they eat from the fruit, and when they do, they suddenly know good from evil. And what they learn is God is good and they're evil. God knew this all along, but he wasn't telling them. Right? So the original sin is that we're not content, human beings are rarely content to follow God and worship God and depend on God because there is some kind of seed down in us that's been there from the very beginning that doesn't want to follow God, we want to be God. And that's what the idol worship is all about. Because here's the thing. What is an idol? An idol was something that the people in all these other lands that they had, that they had business with from Egypt on down to Canaan and everywhere else, items, I mean idols were gods that were created by people. Now think about the logic of this, right? They take clay or gold like in the, the golden calf or whatever. They take some created element. They use their own hands literally to form it into a statue, 
or an idol or whatever, you know, uh, uh, an animal or an image of God or whatever it is. They do this with their own hands. They create it with their own hands. You get this? And then they bow down and worship it. Now, duh. We, they start praying to the God. Now, get this, because this is, this is profound, not because it's me. It's because this is what God is saying. They start praying to the God they created that is made in their image or in the image of some animal around them. They are praying to the creation rather than the creator. And isn't that exactly what human beings are bound to do? They are, in effect, worshiping themselves. If you can create your own God, and then if it doesn't come through for you, throw it in the trash and go make yourself another God. If you're in the business of making gods, you must be God. Who can make a God but God? Is this making any sense to you at all? You know, he, he's saying to them, don't get it in your head like Adam and Eve did that you are God. You're not God. And don't start making stupid idols for yourself that are based on the creation and worship the creation Rather than the creator, I'm the creator. I'm the one who brought you out of, of slavery. So therefore, don't make yourself a God in your own image or in the image of something you own and repeat the same mistake of Adam and Eve that ruined their lives and ruined people ever since. They're worshiping God's handiwork and their own handiwork and investing those things with power that only God has. You know, Paul talks about this in the book of Romans specifically. And he says, you know, becoming foolish in their own speculations, they gave up God and worshiped the creation rather than the creator. They, they worshiped people and they worshiped idols. And God is saying, you can have no other gods before me. It doesn't matter who it is or what it is. If it's part of the created order, you can't worship that. It has no power. You must not think that you're God. He says, I love you jealously. And again, Maimonides says God is not subject to jealousy in the sense that we think of jealousy. But he's, what he is saying is, I, you might put it this way, I love you zealously. I don't want to share your affections with some stupid trinket made in the image of a star or a calf or anything else that I myself created. But that includes other human beings. When you worship these things alongside me, God is saying, you're debasing yourselves and me. You bring me down to that level as if I'm like a frog or a lizard formed of clay and you raise those things up to my level as if they're God. And thus you bring yourselves down to you can't do this and be liberated and elevated and blessed. This self-deception will enslave you all over again. It will make you weak and leave you unprotected. And he says, this makes me angry. The word he uses there for angry in the Hebrew that, that uh, Deuteronomy uh, employs there says means literally to turn dark red. This makes me turn dark red, Moses quotes God as saying. In other words, it greatly upsets him 
but we usually turn it around as if God is so insulted, again, that he wants to, to smash us in the head with a hammer. But what upsets him about this is he knows what this is going to do to us. Does that make sense? He's saying, I've done all this work to set you free, and when you start worshiping anything other than me, you are setting yourself up to become a slave all over again. And this, figuratively speaking, just makes me turn dark red. It makes my head explode because this is not what I want for you. He's speaking out of his great passionate love for us and his concern for our well-being. Ultimately, our worshiping the creation doesn't directly affect God's position or God's well-being, but he knows it's going to destroy us and our relationship with him. It's going to keep us from being what he created us to be. Now, this is the commandment where the prophet said the relationship between God and his people and I said this in the first commandment, is like that of a marriage. And what God is saying here is, I don't want to share you. You're committing spiritual adultery against me. Don't cheat on me. Don't be one of those who hate me. That's what the root of the Hebrew word implies. He says, I bring these judgments on those who hate me. The Hebrew word says that he uses there is, I, I bring these judgments on those who divorce me. He's saying when you leave me, bad things happen. Not because I'm going to do bad things to you, but because I'm the only one who can do good things to you. And if you divorce me and you run away and you take up with some false god, that false god is not going to protect you from yourself or from the world. See, see how he repeats this? And he's saying, so when he's, he talks about the second and third and fourth generations, he's saying it may be that generations before your children or your children's children or your children's 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 children return to me. And they may suffer for generations and live in slavery because you were worshiping all these gods who are not gods. So this one seems like an easy one for us because we're like, well, I ain't got no idols. You know, I haven't built a, I haven't built a statue to Baal and, you know, <laughs> since, since I was a kid. I haven't had a statue to Baal, you know, since I, was, since I was a kid. But there's more to what he's saying here because the bottom line he's saying is don't worship stuff. Don't worship anything that was created rather than worshiping the creator of all things. Okay? So that would include don't worship people. Don't worship a sports hero or a movie star. Don't worship your job. Don't worship your political party. Don't even worship your spouse or your kids. And don't even worship your preacher. Okay, scratch that. You can worship me. <laughs> Don't worship anything that was created. Don't invest anybody or anything else with the power that's due only to God. Because to the, to the extent that we put anything else between us and God we are in effect divorcing ourselves from God and that never ends well. Doesn't mean all these things are bad. Your kid may be wonderful. I'm sure everybody thinks their kid's wonderful. Your spouse may be wonderful. You may have the greatest job you've ever had, but when it starts coming between you and God, and that's more important to you than the work of the Lord and the personality of the Lord. And whatever it is, you find yourself putting the Lord over here so you can go do this other thing. That's a form of idolatry. You're worshiping the creation rather than the creator. And that's what that second commandment is about, is God saying, 
this can only have one result. The only result that can have is you end up in slavery again. And I don't want you to be enslaved. So these commandments, again, are all about liberty. And they're about freedom. And they're about love. I always hated the Ten Commandments. Because I thought God was just beating us over the head with stone tablets and trying to knock us down. And I realize now we should thank God for these commandments every day. You know, because these commandments are God's love letter to us saying, I want to make you truly free. I want, you, I want to make you what I created you to be. Here's how to do it. Here's how to be free. Here's how to live up to your full potential. First of all, he says, give me first place and depend on me and don't worship anything or anybody but me and watch what happens. Amen? Amen. 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 Well, I'm going to close here and we only got two this morning. I don't think that surprises anybody. (laughs) But we're going to close with a word of prayer. And then we'll move on to the next segment. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for your word and we thank you for bringing us here together this morning. And Lord, help us to understand your commandments for what they are, your word of liberation and freedom and love to us. And let us have those commandments written on our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.